Welcome to the Cardiac Emma Learner Series, a unique video tutorial program under the aegis of Indian Association of Cardiac Imaging. This program is focused on beginners and intermediate images with learning happening through short sessions and case-based discussions. We are grateful to experts from different parts of India who have helped us in putting this program together. Please do feel free to give us your feedback so we can continually improve such training opportunities. This session is brought to you by Dr. Pudhyavan, who is a lead consultant radiologist in cardiothoracic imaging in Kowai Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. He has expertise in adult and congenital cardiac MR and CT with interest in interstitial lung disease. He finished his initial training in Apollo Heart Center, Chennai, and then took up his fellowship in Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences and is a level 3 CMR certified radiologist from the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. He has 10 publications in national and international journals and has been a part of the organizing committee for a number of CMEs and conference on cardiac imaging. Welcome to CMR Learners Series. I am Dr. Pudhyavan, Consultant Cardiothoracic Radiologist from Kovey Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore. This session will be on CMR features of infiltrative cardiomyopathies. The objective of this talk will be to find out what is infiltrative cardiomyopathy, the various causes for infiltrative cardiomyopathies, how these disorders present to a clinician, what is the next logical step in its assessment, and to see a few case examples of infiltrative cardiomyopathies. So, what is an infiltrative cardiomyopathy? These are nothing but abnormal deposition of metabolites either in the myocytes or in the extracellular matrix in between the myocytes. This can result in either a replacement fibrosis due to myocardial damage or an infiltrative or reactive interstitial fibrosis. The etiology of infiltrative cardiomyopathy can be divided into inherited acquired or idiopathic. The inherited causes are due to deposition of abnormal metabolites like in Anderson-Fabry disease or Dannon disease. And in iron overload cardiomyopathy, there is deposition of iron in the myocardium which is often associated with thalassemia or hemochromatosis. The acquired causes of infiltrative cardiomyopathy are granulomatous myocarditis like tuberculosis or sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, radiation or drug induced cardiomyopathies, and endomyocardial fibrosis or hyperusinophilic syndromes. In majority of the cases of infiltrative cardiomyopathies, the cause is still unknown. Pericardial diseases are often clubbed together with infiltrative cardiomyopathies mainly because of the overlap of imaging findings. The clinical presentation of a person with infiltrative cardiomyopathy varies widely. The patient can be asymptomatic with an incidentally detected ECG change like heart block. Early in the disease process, they can present with diastolic dysfunction, whereas later they present with heart failure and systolic dysfunction. The patients also often present with arrhythmias like atrial flutter or fibrillation, heart blocks or ventricular tachycardia where the symptoms usually are palpitations, giddiness and syncopal attacks. Sometimes there can be an acute coronary syndrome like presentation with often normal coronaries. Once a patient is suspected of infiltrative cardiomyopathy, what is the next logical step? There are a battery of investigations that are available at our disposal. The first 
is an ECG which can identify heart blocks, atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. The next available investigation is echocardiogram which shows a diastolic dysfunction early in the disease process which progresses to a systolic dysfunction with reduced ejection fraction later on. Echo also picks up myocardial hypertrophy in this patients. Coronary angiogram is often done especially when the patient has an ACS-like acute presentation. Cardiac MR is the investigation of choice for characterization of the myocardium, while electrophysiologic mapping is often used for treatment planning. The standard cardiac MR protocol consists of an anatomic survey and an axial black blood of the chest to look at extracardiac structures. This is followed by the standard imaging planes like the two chamber, four chamber, three chamber, and LVOT cine views. T1 and T2 mapping, when available, can really help in picking up subclinical disease in the myocardium. This is followed by edema imaging using still images in short axis, two chamber, and four chamber views. Once a gadolinium based contrast is given, a late gadolinium enhancement image is obtained using a PSIR sequence at 10 to 15 minutes post contrast to look for myocardial scarring. The Q flow images of IOTA and MPA are used to determine the flow in these major arteries, and the QP by QS can also help in finding out the presence of any shunts. A post contrast T1 is often obtained for anatomical imaging of the chest. There are a few additional sequences that can be used in specific circumstances like the free breathing real time SSFP CINE sequence to look for constrictive physiology and the T2 star images to quantify the myocardial ion. Let's review a few of the common infiltrative cardiomyopathies that are encountered in day to day practice. Cardiac amyloidosis results from the extracellular deposition of amyloid fibrils in the interstitial space. This results in an abnormal contractility, abnormal electric conduction and coronary blood flow. There are two types depending on the composition of the amyloid fibrils that get deposited, the AL and ATTR types. The deposition of amyloid produces a thickened non-compliant myocardium which results in a diastolic dysfunction. This is followed by second myocyte damage and replacement fibrosis resulting in systolic dysfunction. The deposition of amyloid in the conduction system results in heart blocks and ventricular arrhythmias. There is also deposition of the fibrils along the coronary microvasculature resulting in a microvascular dysfunction and myocardial ischemia. The CMR features of amyloidosis are variable. These include LV hypertrophy with a reduced LV compliance. There is often great difficulty in proper nulling of the myocardium in delayed enhancement images. The TI scout images done to determine the appropriate nulling time often shows a reversal of nulling where the myocardium nulls before the LV cavity. This is due to presence of gadolinium contrast in a higher concentration in the interstitial spaces of the myocardium than in the LV cavity. The late gadolinium enhancement images reveal a diffuse subendocardial enhancement which can progress to a transmural enhancement late in the disease process with the appearance of replacement fibrosis. The other typical imaging features are the presence of interatrial septal thickening and the thickening of AV valves with regurgitation. This is a patient with LVH and LV dysfunction referred to cardiac MR 
to assess the cause for LV dysfunction. At the top, we see the two chamber, four chamber, and short axis CNE images, which shows a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy and a diffuse global hypokinesis. In the bottom left is the late gadolinium enhancement images that shows a diffuse concentric subendocardial delayed enhancement of the LV myocardium. The color coded images at the bottom are the native and enhanced T1 mapping images showing a diffusely raised native T1 values and the ECV values. We can also notice that there is thickening of the interatrial septum, a small pericardial effusion and bilateral AV valve regurgitation. This is the TI scout of the patient taken to determine the inversion time for myocardial nulling. As you can see, there is reversal of nulling in this patient where the myocardium nulls before the LV cavity. This is due to the pooling of contrast agent in the expanded extracellular space of the myocardium. This is another patient with similar concentric LVH with a preserved systolic function. The top row shows concentric LV hypertrophy, mild interatrial septal thickening and a mild to moderate mitral regurgitation. The bottom left is a still image showing diffuse myocardial hyperintensity. The two chamber and short axis late gadolinium enhancement images show a diffuse subendocardial delayed enhancement in the LV with enhancement along the RV side of the septum 2. To conclude, cardiac MR is very specific in the identification and diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. Cardiac sarcoidosis and tuberculosis are one of the frequently encountered cardiomyopathies in the Indian subcontinent. Cardiac sarcoidosis is a granulometrous infiltration of the myocardium which is often patchy to begin with. The granulometrous inflammation in cardiac sarcoidosis consists of three stages. The stage of inflammation and edema, granuloma formation and finally fibrosis and scarring. Initially, there is myocardial thickening with edema and a diastolic dysfunction. In later stages, there is replacement fibrosis of the myocardium that has been damaged by the inflammation when systolic dysfunction predominates. The granulometrous inflammation can involve either the pericardium, myocardium or endocardium. The inflammation typically involves the LV lateral wall and the basal septum and when they involve the conduction system, they often present with ventricular arrhythmias. Findings of granulomatous cardiomyopathy consists of an often patched mid-myocardial involvement early in the disease process. Later in the disease process, there is scarring and wall thinning showing wall motion abnormalities not corresponding to a vascular territory. There is also a preferential involvement of the basal septum and lateral wall of the LV. Myocardial edema is often seen in the phase of active inflammation in still images, whereas areas of replacement fibrosis are seen as patchy areas of LGE in the mid-myocardial and epicardial regions. The fibrosis then coalesces in the later stages into confluent transmural enhancement resulting in dilated cardiac chambers and systolic dysfunction. T1 mapping and ECV will show raised values in areas of scarring and occasionally we will be able to pick up certain extracardiac features of sarcoidosis which should be actively sought after. This is a 35 year old who presented with ventricular tachycardia. The two chamber, four chamber 
and the short axis cine images revealed normal wall motion and LV function with no LVH. The still images on the bottom left revealed subtle areas of myocardial edema in the anterolateral segment. On delayed enhancement images, focal areas of mid and epicardial scarring was noted in the mid anterolateral segment. The non scarred myocardium revealed normal T1 values. These findings raised a suspicion of granulomatous infiltrative pathology. With the suspicion of sarcoidosis, the post contrast T1 Dixon image was assessed, which revealed mediastinal adenopathy. The correlation chest CT, which was then done, showed focal areas of interstitial thickening and interstitial nodules in the upper lobes consistent with sarcoidosis. This is another case which shows a dilated LV with severe LV dysfunction. The delayed enhancement images show an extensive confluent areas of myocardial scarring in the septum and lateral wall with few patchy areas of mid myocardial fibrosis in the septum. So, a granulomatous etiology should always be considered when there is a patchy myocardial involvement and always should look for extra cardiac findings in these cases. Inherited cardiomyopathies are mainly due to storage disorders like Fabry's disease, Danon's, and Frederick's ataxia. In these group of patients, there is a preferential intracellular deposition of abnormal metabolites resulting in left ventricular hypertrophy and a restrictive physiology. These group of conditions are also unique in that they show a reduction in native T1 values with no increase in the extracellular space. In late stages of disease, there is myocyte necrosis and replacement fibrosis causing severe systolic dysfunction and an increase in the T1 values. The cardiac MR findings in this heterogeneous group of disorders consists of LV hypertrophy with a restrictive ventricular physiology. In Fabry's disease, there is a typical mid myocardial late gadolinium enhancement seen preferentially involving the infralateral segments. These patients also show a low native T1 value and an increased T2 value. The identification of myocardial scarring through LGE is important in these patients as enzyme replacement therapy has been shown to reverse LVH, improve the LV ejection fraction and the exercise capacity of these patients. This is an 18 year old male with dilated LV and concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. The CINE images show a diffuse global hypokinesia. In the bottom row, no appreciable late gadolinium enhancement in the delayed enhancement images. However, the T1 mapping reveals a diffusely reduced native T1 values, suggesting the possibility of a storage disorder like Danon disease. The last of the disorders that we will see today is endomyocardial fibrosis. There are varied etiopathogenesis that is proposed for endomyocardial fibrosis. These include eosinophilia due to parasitic infestations and eosinophilic infiltrates in heart, autoimmune related affection of the heart, and dietary and toxic causes. Irrespective of the etiology, these disorders have three distinct stages in their pathogenesis. The first is an acute necrotic phase which presents with a diffuse subendocardial edema, inflammatory cell infiltration, and late gadolinium enhancement. The intermediate phase is a phase of a layered thrombus formation in the ventricular cavity in response to the inflammation in the first phase. The late fibrotic phase shows distortion of the ventricular cavity due to fibrosis 
and a diffuse subendocardial enhancement. On functional imaging, they show a restrictive physiology. The CMR findings of endomyocardial fibrosis consists of a diastolic dysfunction with restrictive pattern. There is distortion of the RV cavity and LV apex due to the diffuse subendocardial fibrosis. Due to the restrictive pattern, there is also bi edge dilatation with AV valve regurgitation. In the acute phase, there can be a diffuse subendocardial edema and enhancement. A layered thrombus in the ventricular cavity is typical of endomyocardial fibrosis. This is a 40 year old female who shows a distortion of the RV and the LV cavity in the CV images with diastolic dysfunction. There is a resultant bi atrial dilatation and mild AV valve regurgitation. The still image also reveals a mild subendocardial edema. The mid image in the lower row is an early Gardnerian enhancement image which shows a typical layered thrombus in the LV cavity as hypointense structure. While the late Gardnerian enhancement image on the right demonstrates the subendocardial fibrosis and scarring as enhancement. To conclude, the comprehensive evaluation of infiltrated cardiomyopathies remains a diagnostic challenge. Early identification of restrictive physiology and type of infiltration is important to prevent irreversible injury. Cardiac MR identifies typical morphological and functional changes, is useful in assessing disease activity, prognostication and in serial assessment of treatment response. Newer parametric mapping techniques have the ability to quantify fibrosis and edema with pixel level T1 and T2 values. Please feel free to give your valuable feedback in the comment section. Thank you.